Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the empirical gas laws. These are the laws. Uh, empirical means that they were derived by observation of gases uh, and their behavior when subjected to different kinds of changes. Changes, And so the two that I'll talk about here are Boyle and Charles' law, and I'll sort of explain how they work and how you do the calculations with them. But then I want you to go ahead and explore the other ones on your own because they're all done exactly the same way. And I have a list of them and how you uh, and their properties uh, at the end of this uh, set of slides. So Boyle's law is the idea that, that the pressure and volume of a gas are inversely related. Okay, so it doesn't sound right when I say it, but it it's actually true. So let me show you what I mean. Take a balloon that looks like this. And it's on a string, so it could be a helium balloon, for example, right? And and you drive up to Kings Canyon, right? So you're at, at sea level down here, and and then you're up at, at Kings Canyon. Let's say you're at eight about eight thousand feet, okay? What's the balloon look like? Well, if anybody's if any of you have gone up to the mountains or gone high in elevation, had a bag of potato chips or any sort of sealed container, one of the things that you know that happens is that it gets bigger. So rather than being that little small balloon anymore, it'll get larger. And in fact, inflatable like dinghies or boats, if you start off at the valley floor and you go up to Kings Canyon, you actually need to release quite a bit of air before you leave because when you get up there, they'll blow up to this enormous size and a lot of them will just burst uh, before you get to the top. So what, what's going on here? Well, there's clearly an increase in volume, right? So I have V1 and I have V2 and we know for sure V2 is going to be greater than V1 at higher elevation. Well, What's true about the pressure at higher elevation, and what's true is, is, is that the pressure is lower. You have less atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure that you're feeling is created by the molecules and the gravitational forces that pull those molecules down on top of you for the air all the way up into outer space. Okay, so all that pressure, right, you feel it at sea level, but as you go up in the mountains, there's, there's less air above you, and so the pressure is lower. You could feel that when you go in higher elevations as your ears popping, as, as the pressure inside your ears is higher than the outside pressure, and then the air has to come out, and that's what the popping in your ears is. So this is pressure is lower. So I'll call this P2. Pressure is lower. So P1, right, is higher pressure, but at high elevation, pressure is lower. So I know that P2 is actually less than P1. And one of the things that we notice about Boyle's law, and I'll show you how he did it experimentally, but um, about Boyle's law is we, we say that pressure is inversely uh, proportional to the volume. And so if you think about what that means, right, is if the pressure is lower, the volume is larger. If the pressure is higher, the volume is smaller. So that's the way uh, we talk about, and, it, and that's the way we make sense of the idea of increasing pressure, decreasing volume. Okay. Now, Charles' law is a, sim a similar kind of behavior. So Boyle did pressure and volume. Charles did pressure or volume and temperature. And you know, back in those days, in the in the early late 1500s, early 1600s, if you just um, had an idea, a lot of you, a lot of people just got laws named after them because they were able to or had the luxury of having sponsors that allowed them to do research and and understand like the the natural laws um, uh, at their expense. So these guys, Boyles and Charles, are no different. Um, what Charles did, uh, and you can imagine, I'll just give you an example with the balloon, right? Oop, bad balloon, here, do that again. Here's my balloon, right? Here's V1, and many of you know what will happen, right? And here's my T1, whatever it happens to be. And then I have a, another balloon, and I have a T2. Well, let me make it a little bit bigger. 
I'll make another one that's a little bit smaller too. There's another temperature, right? What do you know about T2 versus T1? Right? We know V2 is larger and T2 is larger, right? So while Boyle's law is inversely, this is a direct proportionality. And what that means is, is if the variable increases, another variable that's directly proportional will also increase. So the temperature goes up, the volume goes up in proportion to the temperature's change. Now, having said that, uh, and this is something that I just have to emphasize at first because people aren't used to doing it, that temperature has to be measured in Kelvin. All the other empirical gas laws, you can use basically any unit you want, and they work. But for temperature, and I'll talk about this later, the temp for Charles' law, where that incorporates temperature, you have to have temperature in Kelvin. Well, if I look at this situation, right, how does that T compare to T1 and T2, right? Well, it's smaller than V1, so we'll call this V3 for now, right? That means T3 has to be the lowest of the bunch because it's the smallest. So again, directly proportional means if the temperature is lower, the volume is smaller. And also if the volume is smaller, it must imply a lower temperature. Now having said all that, um, there's a lot of things when you talk about these kinds of laws that have to be made constant or assumed to be constant. So for example, in Charles' law, we have to assume that we're not changing pressure and we're not adding moles to the gas. It's just the same sample of gas under different temperature conditions. The same thing's true for Boyle's Law. When you're looking at Boyle's Law, we have to make sure some other things are true. And one of those is because volume is dependent on temperature is that you're not allowing the temperature to change when these kinds of things happen. All right. So now what we're going to do is look specifically at how Boyle uh, measured or made his observations, okay, and some of the data that Boyle originally generated in creating what we now know as Boyle's Law. So this is what the apparatus looked like that Boyle used to create what we call Boyle's Law, okay? And basically, it's a glass tube that's shaped like a J, so it's called a J-tube, actually. It's the name of it. And what they do in a J-tube is they fill the mercury up so that the levels on both sides of the tube are the same. Now, in order to do that, they actually have to take the tube and then you lay it down. Like if you imagine this is flat, right? This is the tube standing up. What they do is they, they lay the tube down slightly and they fill it with mercury. And then what they do is they stand it up. And then when you do that, what that allows to happen is it allows gas to pass back and forth there until uh, it's vertical enough that it seals. And if you do it just right and you're careful, then what happens is you get equal levels of mercury on the inside and the outside. So this is very much like a manometer. Right? that the height difference between here and here is telling you about the pressure difference from the outside versus the inside. And in this situation, since the levels are the same, there must be one atmosphere gas on the inside, right? one atmosphere gas on the outside, and this is the volume of my gas. Now, remember, this might be P1 right here which is atmospheric pressure, and, and this is V1, and then what we do is we add mercury to the tube on the outside. Now, because this tube is sealed, right, it can't just keep rising up. It has to compress the gas, and when you get to a pressure of one atmosphere of mercury, so this is one atmosphere of mercury now, 1 atmhg, that's actually on top of the atmospheric pressure. So really, the total pressure on the right-hand side of this tube is two atmospheres. And what I've effectively done is I've doubled the pressure. And when you double the pressure, what Boyle found out is that the volume of the gas was cut in half. So again, that's the inverse proportionality, doubled pressure, half the volume. Okay. If you do three times and you... Uh, that's 
1520, so that's actually two atmospheres, right? Three times the original pressure, because remember, this is one atmosphere here. Then he found that the volume cut to one-third its original volume. So, again, uh, this is how Boyle did his experiments. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to go to the Royal Society and uh, actually look at uh, documents that Boyle generated. So this is actually from his experimental account of the compression. This F is a double S. Compression of air uh, made by Mr. Boyle. And it was entered in the, I think it's the 8th month, 2nd day. So August 2nd of 1661. And in essence, what Boyle said is that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. And this is actually how you write an inverse proportionality. So what that means is because P and V are equal to a constant, if P goes up, then V has to go down because that will be a constant. K, we'll just call it K for now. So I was going to show you a little bit more information as well. This is actually Boyle's data, which was also uh, in that paper. So a long table of numbers where he described it. And this is a graph of that data. And this is what an inverse proportionality looks like. This is inches of mercury, literally you know, measured by height. And so he almost went up to 100 inches. So that's quite a bit. And then this is the volume, and actually I don't know what the unit of this volume is. It, it, I don't think it was milliliters. I think it was uh, just relative units. So if you call this 12, by the time that you got to one atmosphere, that would be about here, right? It was half that volume. Okay, so this is how I want to explain to you how you use Boyle's Law in a problem. And we're going to actually solve all the gas law problems sort of the same way. The first thing you have to recognize is that the pressure times the volume is always equal to a constant. So basically we call these change of state problems. We're going to change the state of the gas and calculate one of its properties at the new state. So in Boyle's law, I'll have pressure and volume equal to a constant. And where we start a problem will be in state one. Okay, so this is going to be state one that's where the start is and then what we're going to do is we're going to change it into state two so state two was where you finish now because of Boyle's law what we can write is that p2 v2 is equal to a constant and the important thing to recognize about Boyle's law is this is the same constant So now what that allows us to do is it allows us to rela relate P1 and V1 to P2 and V2. So P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And this is what we'll be using in Boyle's Law. Now, when we set up these problems, and you'll, you'll see why later as we do more uh, complicated problems, uh, what you want to do is you want to set up a little table. You're going to have state 1 and state 2. And in the problems that we're doing right now, we just have pressure and volume. But later, we're going to add columns to this, and we'll be able to sort of sort our data out and fill in this table so that we can see what variables are missing and what units need to be changed and things like that. Okay, So you're going to read through a problem, and, and when you read through the problem, what you'll be doing is you'll be looking for these values in a Boyle's Law problem. And you'll recognize it's a Boyle's Law problem because they'll talk about pr only pressure and volume being changed. So here's an example of one of the those kinds of problems. It says a gas bubble rising in the water increases in volume from 525 milliliters to 3 liters when it reaches the surface. Now, one of the things people often forget, so I put it in here, but it says given that the surface pressure is one atmosphere, because it doesn't go to zero pressure when it hits the top, but right? it's at one atmosphere, what was the pressure when the bubble began rising? So we can do it real quick. Let's make our table, right, and organize our data. And so we're going to have P and V, and we'll have 1 and 2. 
and then we can uh, identify, well, I have 525 mils. And then I have three liters. Now, you notice there's a dis discrepancy here. And it, it turns out what you'll have to do is you'll always have to convert them to be the same unit. And you'll see how that works when we use the equation. Uh, but it says the surface pressure is one atmosphere. So this is the pressure at the surface. And this is going to be ATM. And I think I'm going to choose actually to convert the milliliters into liters. And so I can go like this. It's a thousand milliliters. Or actually, you could do a thousand at the bottom, or you can go 10 to the minus third liters is a milliliter, like that. And then we can find that that's equal to 0 0.525 liters. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set up Boyle's equation. We have P1V1 equals P2V2. And it looks like I'm solving for P1, right? So now I'm going to divide both sides by V1. This will cancel out here. And so now I have P1 is equal to P2V2 over V1 like this. And I can plug my values in. So for my pressure, I'm going to put 1.00. This is ATMs. This is liters over here. So um, 1.00 ATM. And then I put in volume 2, which is 3.0 liters. Oops, sorry. And I'm dividing by... Um, 0.525 liters like this. You notice why the units have to be the same now. The liters need to cancel like that. And then I'll go ahead and I'll calculate the... And that's 9.524 is what it comes out to. Atmospheres. And in my calculations, I have three... The three liters has two significant figures, so it's 9.5 atmospheres. So when that bubble started down in the water, it was at 9.5 atmospheres, and as it rose, it, it got to lower and lower pressures, eventually to one atmosphere, when it reached the surface and had a volume of three liters. All right, just a, a little side note. This is one of those interesting things that uh, Tro likes to put in his books. It says, why do divers release air when ascending? And it's, here's the reason. Every... 10 meters of dive depth is about one atmosphere of pressure. So if you think about your lung capacity being a liter, right? If you rise to the surface without expending any air, okay? Then for every 10 meters you go up, 30 feet you go up, it's going to approximately double in volume. And if you don't do that, then what happens is, right, your lungs will burst by the time you get to the top. So if you're starting 60 feet down or 20 meters down, the pressure of water is three atmospheres. That's actually what you have to breathe against. That's why people have a regulator in their mouth to help them breathe high pressure air. And then as they rise, they have to let that air out because when you get to the top, there's only one atmosphere of pressure when you're at the very top. That volume from three to one will roughly triple so that one liter of air in your lungs now becomes three if you don't let it out. All right, so uh, this is Charles' Law, and, and we're going to take a, a molecular view of it. Uh, but remember, Charles' Law is the w idea that volume is proportional to temperature. And when you lower the temperature of a gas, what ha ends up happening is you lower the kinetic energy of the molecules. And even if you don't let any of the gas out, like the balloon develops a leak, for example, because they have lower kinetic energy, there's less force and less pressure, and so the volume gets smaller. If you heat it, put it in boiling water, as the picture shows here from your book, if you heat it, then the balloon expands because even though you haven't changed the number of molecules, now they have more energetic collisions and more frequent collisions and as a result the volume increases all this to say is that volume is directly proportional to temperature okay so how do we use charles law in problems well this is what a direct proportionality looks like volume is equal to k times t where k is a constant and and just like in charles law it's a 
it's the same constant as long as you don't change any other variables. So I can rewrite this as volume divided by temperature is equal to a constant. And under one set of conditions, that would be V1 and T1, it's equal to a constant. And under V2 and T2, that is I change the temperature or I change the volume, it's equal to the same constant. What that allows me to do is it allows me to rewrite my equation into sort of what I call a working form of the equation. And I can write V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Now these problems are really troublesome because when you solve them, what you'll see is that the V1 and the T1 that end up next to each other, I mean the volume and the temperature that ends up next to each other are not V1 and T1. So re-say that. What's really troubling about these when you do these problems is the V and the T that end up next to each other are not the same uh, set of conditions. So for example, if I'm solving for V2, what you end up getting is V1 times T2 over T1. And a lot of times what people will do is they'll scramble these things up and put them in the wrong places. So again, the the thing that I recommend you do is create a table, set one, set two, and then you have your V and your T, and then you can fill in your conditions and then plug your values into the, the equation depending on what you're trying to solve for. So let's look at an example. It says a balloon has a volume of 18.5 liters at 25 degrees Celsius, roughly room temperature. What is the change in volume when it's placed in your freezer at minus 18 degrees Celsius? That, that by the way, is what your freezer is supposed to be at. So um, I'm going to go ahead and set my conditions up. I have V and T, and then I have 1 and 2. And I just read what I have here. So I have 18.5 liters, 18.5 liters. I have 25 degrees Celsius. And then it wants to know what the change in volume is. So that's something to make note of. It doesn't want to know what the volume is. It wants to know what the change of volume is. So now it's going to be uh, at minus 18.0 degrees Celsius. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of, and I'll explain to you why it is in just a second. One of the things you have to be aware of is you always want this to be in Kelvin. And the simple answer for this is just to always add if it's in Celsius, at the table, to add 273.15 to your Celsius numbers, like this. Okay, so that the way I always set these tables up, and you, you'll see this when I set up, it's called the combined gas law. When you see how I set it up, temperature is always on the far right, so you can add the uh, 273.15 to it if you need to, and not have to like change the size of your table and stuff. So when you do this, um, this is 308.15 Kelvin, and this one's going to be 255.15 Kelvin, like that. And now what I can do is I can solve for V2. And you know, it's kind of one of the nice things when you, you set your data up like this. It tells you what variable to solve for, because that's the only blank that's left in the table after you put all the data in. So now what I'm going to do is I say V1 over... T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And what am I solving for? So I'm solving for V2. So I'll cross multiply the T2 across. And so I'll end up with my equation looking like this. V2 is equal to V1 times T2 over T1. And this is where you have to be careful. So I need volume 1. That's 18.5 liters. I need temperature 2. So now I'll go, I'll go down into here. That's my temperature 2. That's 255.15 Kelvin. And then at the bottom, I'll be my temperature 1, 308.15 Kelvin. The Kelvin will cancel. And then when I do the calculation, I'll end up with 15.3182 liters. Um, in terms of significant figures, I have three significant figures based on um, my 18.5. has three here. And now I need to calculate the change in volume. Uh, and I will just tell you, I'm a stickler for this. Delta V 
is v final minus v initial, which is v2 minus v1. And when you do that, what you'll get is 15.3182 um, liters minus 18.5 liters. And I know this bothers people, but you're going to get a minus 3.18 two liters i've only got three sig figs or, or actually my sig figs only go to the tenths place because i'm doing a subtraction so i have a change in volume of negative 3.2 liters that means the negative sign people don't like it but the negative sign simply means the volume's going down from where you started okay so you do final minus initial where i ended from where i and i'm subtracting where i started and that's the change in the volume. Now, here's one of the things I wanted to point about this problem, and I'll go back and I'll show you in the last problem as well. Um, what's really nice about these is you can kind of guess which way things are going to go based on what you understand about gases. So, you know, if you took a balloon, right, and you put it in the freezer, you know it's going to get smaller at lower temperature. So your change in temperature should be a negative number and your final volume should be lower than your initial volume right because you're cooling it down now let's take a look back real quick at this problem and in this problem what's happening is the pressure is going from high pressure to low pressure so what we expect uh, for or sorry it's going from a, a small volume to a large volume right so what we expect is that the pressure will be higher when it started and lower when it ends. So I expect that this pressure would be higher. And when we did the calculation, sure enough, the pressure was higher for the initial conditions. So again, these problems are nice because you, if you think about it just like a balloon and what's happening to the balloon for many of these problems, you can predict which way the answer is going to be, whether it's going to be larger or smaller than the, the value you start with. All right, so I wanted to show you one other thing about Charles' Law, and this is sort of a theoretically important idea, so I would like you to sort of have an understanding of what it is, and that's the idea of something we call absolute zero. So one of the things that Charles noticed is that if you take a certain number of grams or an amount, moles of a gas, at a certain pressure, and you decrease the temperature, so here's the temperature, okay, and you look at the volume, these are Charles Law plots, as you lower the temperature, they consistently decrease, and this slope actually is the K that we would have had from our Charles Law calculations. Now, if you change the amount of moles of gas, or change it to, in fact, a number of moles of gas and even to a different gas, what ends up happening is you get this slope, which again decreases as you decrease temperature. And all this is very consistent with the idea of Charles' law that volume is directly proportional to temperature. But the thing that Charles noticed that was really interesting when you look at all these data, data lines is that they all converge to a single point. Now, it's kind of a nonsensical point. It actually, that point there essentially means that the volume is going to zero at this particular temperature. Uh, and if you think about it some more, right, um, you can't do that. You can't go to zero volume. So what does this temperature actually mean? It, the interpretation it was originally uh, this, that that's the lowest possible temperature that you can achieve because you can't get below zero volume. Right? So this is known as absolute zero, and it's pretty much held up. The idea of zero, uh, uh, absolute zero is kind of held up. Uh, all this time, it's only recently that uh, people have been able to sort of demonstrate you can achieve uh, situations where the temperature appears to be below absolute zero. But considering when this was done about the same time as uh, Boyle's Law, uh, those demonstrations of temperatures below absolute zero are only shown uh, in the last five years. And so uh, it's pretty good to say that absolute zero is the lowest temperature that you can achieve. Now, 
Having said that, this is where the Kelvin scale arises. That is, if we call this zero, then all the volumes are then proportional to temperature as long as they're using this temperature as zero, the Kelvin scale. Okay, So this is the reason why we have to use Kelvin in uh, gas laws is because volumes really are only proportional if you're looking at them in terms of Kelvin temperature and not Celsius temperature.